and thank you everybody for organizing this event. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. So can people see the screen? All yeah. Set. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, I just wanna do the laser pointer. So thank you everybody. Thank you for stopping by to listen to this talk and yeah, and happy public health week, right? So let's get started. Uh, and well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what implications do, does the air we breathe have in our health? And particularly I'm gonna focus in the next generation, which of course implies our children. So to start with a brief outline, I'm gonna talk about air pollution and health, some of the experimental evidence that links uh, air pollution and particularly, I'm gonna talk about particulate matter and health, some of the mechanisms that are underlying like oxidative stress and inflammation and how they participate in disease and uh, what happens during early life, early life and maternal exposure. And at the end, uh, I would like to have everybody join me in um, like a discussion or uh, thinking about what implications or are we doing enough for the next generations? What strateg strategies can we come up with? What are strategies are there in terms of policy, public, uh, public policy, but is there anything else that we should or we can do? Right, so having said that, so I, I entitled my talk, Every Breath We Take, of course, making a simulation of the song, but also because, well, there's like the one thing we need to do for surviving is breathing. We, we need uh, air to survive. Every day a person <clears throat> breathes about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 gallons per of air, which is all, uh, if we make a simulation, it's almost enough to fill up a normal size swimming pool. So that is a lot of air. And this amount of air is necessary to, to carry on all our activities in one day because it's, the, it's what we need, it's the amount of air we need to oxygenate the 2000 approx gallons of blood for an adult that is pumped through the human heart daily. So when we see clean air, while we're happy, we think about, oh, today's sunny, shall we go for a walk, a bicycle ride? We don't really even think about what's the issue with air pollution. However, when we have a bad uh, air day or a, a air, uh, high polluted air day, then we think about, oops, I think something's going on. The air is not clean. Should I, should I not, or should I go out? What, what does it imply for me and what does it imply for everybody around me, to my family and especially to the young ones? So unfortunately, we've not been doing very well. I took this uh, news from some of um, uh, newsletters that, are, that were online uh, related with Southern California, but this is a global problem. It's not only here, right? So although some actions have been made and there are a lot of actions that we want to be taken care of, there's still, according to um, <clears throat> the American Lung Association, uh, for example, there are 40% uh, of Americans live in areas with unhealthy levels of pollution. So in terms of grades, uh, unfortunately, we're still getting an F, and I will show you a little bit um, further down why. So what is air pollution? So uh, with the growth of world population, urbanization, technological progress, and the demand of energy and transport increases, uh, this has led to a dynamic but constant regular emission of sun substances into the, atmos into the atmosphere or into the air. So air pollution, we, we define air pollution as the presence of any substance that is altering the natural composition of the atmosphere or the air, and that can cause damage to health and the environment. So this is all very well known, and these are some of the uh, air pollutants that we know are present in the air, and I will uh, go into detail of them um, later on. So how is air pollution, how is air pollution uh, generated. So we start with the sources. So we have what we call stationary sources or point sources that are uh, 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 the emissions of the industry 
The mission of small businesses, even a barbecue or when we're putting petrol in our, in our cars. And then we have the natural sources. So natural sources, of course, are uh, dust in the air, emissions from volcanoes, and something that affects here in California, which are wildfires. These are all stationary sources of pollutant emissions. But, and these, all these will uh, contribute to the air, different type of chemicals like sulfur dioxide, nitric oxides, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter that with the reaction of humidity, the time, the distance, there are photochemical reactions to bring us to secondary type of pollutants. And uh, primary pollutants and secondary type pollutants are known to affect the environment and affect, uh, the, uh, affect health. So for secondary pollutants, we have PM 2.5, sulfites, nitrates, carbon in different forms. But what does this mean? Also, uh, we have a big contributor, which are mobile sources. So in this sense, mobile sources also emit primary pollutants, but these primary pollutants behave differently according to the, the time of the day. That's uh, because it has to do with temperature, it has to do with UV light, and it has to do with the chemicals that are already in the air and how they react with the uh, primary pollutants and with the chemical reactions that are taking care uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. So this brings us to the main pollutants that we know or we study almost during the day. So we're going to come up with ozone, we're going to come up with particulate matter, with carbon monoxide, with nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide, which are the ones that mainly affect or are known to be stressors for human health and for the environment. Having said that, and as a type of summary, what uh, the main air sources of air pollution are the industry, the energy supply, transport, waste management, dust, agricultural practices, and household energy. So at the end of the day, if we see there are the natural sources there, but also all the human activities. And the important thing is, are we taking care of trying to reduce the emissions to the air? In this sense, <clears throat> sorry, the way we look at it is that we measure air quality. And how do we measure air quality? Well, if it's a measurement, of course we need some indicators to be able to know how much and which are the ones that are going to give us a proper air quality. So normally we have, depends on the region, seven or six different air quality criteria. So they are ozone, nitric oxide, sulfur oxide, dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, sometimes lead, and especially particulate matter. For particulate matter, we measure according their concentration and size, but little do we know about their composition. And I will take this idea later in my talk, but I do want to mention it and uh, want you to remember this. And why is this also important? We take the air quality criteria to build up what we call or we know the air quality index. And the air quality index is a way of communicating to the public if we should or should not be worried about how big or how um, polluted is the air. So as I mentioned earlier, when the air is clean, we wanna go for a ride, we wanna go for a nice walk. We don't even think about, is it polluted, is it not polluted? But when we see haze, when we see it's a little bit cloudy, but we don't understand why, well then we have this instrument that is gonna tell us, is it safe or is it not safe? Unfortunately, when we have big incidences of wildfires or in some cities where they have high levels of uh, pollutants, they can be in orange or even in, in red, which means you should avoid going out to um, do any activity because there will be an impact that can be an immediate impact, an acute type of response. And of course, we should also worry about the long-term or the chronic exposures. So in this sense, and I'm sure you are all familiar with this icon, we have in our smartphones, a little icon that says weather. And we like looking at the weather because then we know what we should we wear because we all like to look nice, have a sweater if we're cold, right? 
And here, well, it says the this nice um, uh, applications. Now they also give us the air quality. And not everybody, not all the people know that you can use this instrument to protect your house. So if you know you are sensitive to certain type of pollutants, or if you're gonna do an activity which is outdoors and the air quality is not good, then you should definitely try to avoid exposure because there will be an impact that can be immediate but in the long term as well. So uh, everybody has this in their smartphone and we should definitely be using it not only for the for temperature, but also to look at the air quality. That was just a, a recommendation. Well, but going into the, the important part of the talk. So what we, what we know is uh, we look at the global burden of disease. Oops, sorry about that. Right. So we look at the global burden of disease. And in this sense, the Institute for Health Metrics and an evaluation in 2006, which is almost gonna be 10 years of this type of, of, of uh, measurement, we know that uh, air pollution is re was responsible in 2013 in the study for 5.5 million deaths. And this is happening all over the world. This is a global problem that we should all worry about. And this, because this has an impact and of course it contributes to climate change. But not only that, this same institute has done several studies, follow-up studies, and in 2010, air pollution as a burden of disease, not only mortality, but of disease was in number 11. And unfortunately nowadays it's number five. So it's scaled up almost six places, which means although we're doing changes and we are talking about air pollution, we still have a lot of work to do because uh, now we know that we're talking about air pollution indoors and outdoors, but it's still one of the major contributors for uh, the global burden of disease. So what happens when you're exposed to air pollutants? So in a long magnitude, if you take the population as a pyramid, a lot of people will experience like long function decrements, inflammation, maybe some cardiac events. Some people, um, a less amount of people may have some symptoms, require medical assistance or even trigger an asthma attack. Some people will unfortunately not go, not go to work or even school absences and require a regular doctor visits. A less amount of people may be going to the ER, but some people, and it's been monetized and also it's been accounted for. In 2013, the World Health Organization declared air pollution, particularly ozone in particular matter, as a carcinogenic to humans. But this is, as you, as you can see in the pyramid, one of the very uh, unfortunate events that are happening, but a large amount of the population will be experiencing some events that are related with respiratory tract, like asthma, uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, altered lung function, cardiovascular diseases, and other affectations, and affectations during pregnancy, premature death, or uh, premature births, and delayed infant lung development. So this is an, a silent but a constant aggressor to, uh, to, to human population, and it has everything to do with the type of activities that we do. But why are we, or did I want to focus on children? Why do, what makes children different? Well, of course, it's the impact that it can have because uh, children are growing up. So in a way we are, let's say, making a bet or jeopardizing their future, jeopardizing their health in the sense that their lungs are not completely developed it can affect their mental and motor development and it can contribute to behavioral disorders. It contributes to low birth weight, to childhood cancers, and it contributes to increased risk of heart and disease, as well as diabetes and other uh, metabolic disorders. And how, I'm gonna show you later uh, how we link this type of evidence that is well known 
that is uh, put out there by uh, the World Health Organizations and other uh, global and local organizations that are taking care of us. But the, I will show you some data that is linking this type of event with some information and some um, evidence that is just in the top tip of our fingers. So when uh, I talk about why it matters for, and why are we uh, worried about children, it's because air pollution will damage children's health chronic, uh, it will induce chronic and acute effects. Children are uniquely vulnerable to air pollution because they breathe faster than adults. They are taking more pollutants relatively to their body size. They're always in constant movement. So they are running, jumping, climbing trees, et cetera. And they will be exposed to, to uh, they will be more exposed to, to pollutants. Their lungs, brains, organs, and cardiovascular system are still maturing and they are more sensitive to inflammation unless they have a less defense in their organism. And it's linked to the increased risk of childhood cancers, infant mortality, ear infections, reduced lung function, and developing of asthma as a condition. Air pollution can impair cognitive development, affect maternal exposure, which is um, linked to stillbirth, premature birth and low birth weight, and also environmental stressors. And this is a little bit related to what we will see in the experimental model, are, have been also um, linked to modifications in the human genome. So the imprinting of certain alterations that are related with our genes due to the stress in the environment will have for sure an implication in our health later on in our lives, especially if this imprinting or these modifications take place when we are young or when we are growing up. And this process is called programming. So it matters because we know, and this is only for the United States, but it happens all around the world, as I show you, that uh, children from zero to 17 years live in counties with pollutant concentrations above the levels of the air quality standards. So to generate or to guarantee a good air quality, we have a quality standards that are policies that we're supposed to be following and we're supposed to be complying to. But unfortunately, a, lo a large number of children are living in areas where the air qualities are not being complied. And this is particularly for ozone and for PM 2.5s, for, um, uh, for PM 2.5s in a 24 hour guideline and in an annual guideline and for, other, for the other gases that are used as criteria. But ozone and particulates are the most important. And what do we know about this? The impacts of, of this exposure in adults, we know we have cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, and in children, as we, I mentioned before, diseases that have to do with the respiratory system, system and birth outcomes. So um, in this matter, what we do in the laboratory and what, what we do as toxicologists is try to come up with information where we can link and we can identify these um, center processes that, are, that we can use as models to say, we need to reduce this type of pollution or we need to reduce this type of indicator to um, give, to have a better air, but also to, to have a better or cleaner environment where we can all live. So in this sense, I'm gonna show you a little bit of evidence that we've done in the lab where we uh, link oxidative stress and inflammation to disease. And then we looked at the epigenetic changes, the programming that I talked before of early exposure to do or to take um, into account the evidence-based toxicology to translation toxicology. So for this, if we focus on the air quality criteria, as I said before, if we focus only on particles, because we also have ozone, and I'm not going to go into the um, details of ozone this time because of in the interest of time, but I'm going to focus on particles. So 
We have short uh, term exposures and long term exposures, but overall particles are known to cause shortness of breath, wheezing and coughing, chest pain, fatigue, and also they can worsen cardio cardiovascular heart disease, asthma, and other uh, long, long diseases. But what are particles? Particles are substances that exist in the form of solid uh, material or finely particulated material. They have a wide range of sizes. They're suspended in the air. And because they, uh, they are able to react in the atmosphere and to reach the airways of the lower respiratory tract, they are co considered of toxicological relevance. So actually, particles are the, let's say, they are the emergency light that we have when we are exposed to air pollutant because we can see them. So they will account for the haze as well as, as ozone, but it will, they will account for the haze or the darkness, or maybe it's a little bit cloudy and we know they are there and that's when it's our alarm to worry, but they are there all the time. They are so tiny that we don't always see them. So we classify them according to their art aerodynamic size. The aerodynamic size is the way they move in the atmosphere, which that this means that it's not like there are little spheres floating around. They, according to the, how they are uh, conceived or how they are generated, it's the, the form or shape and size that they will take. So for this, we classify them to study them as PM10s or P particles that are larger than 10 microns that come from volcanic emissions, soil erosion, coarse particles that have the size between 2.5 and 10, PM2.5 uh, or fine particles, which are those particles that are less than 2.5 microns and that come also from the emission of burning, burning fossil fuels, and then uh, uh, also ultrafine particles. These are particles that are lower than 0.1 microns, and they come also from industry, from uh, industry emissions, from stationary sources, as I said before, and from uh, mobile sources. So uh, this is um, the this um, is giving us the size particle diameter, but how deep into the respiratory deposition, how deep into the respiratory tract they can reach. So larger particles will stay in the um, head airways or the upper respiratory airways, whereas uh, smaller particles can reach the tracheobronchial area or even the respiratory area or the alveolar system. Why are we worried about particles? So particles, we can, um, they are uh, primary and secondary type of air pollutants. So they come from processes, physical chemical processes of nucleation, condensation, agglomeration, depending on their sources, their size. This is a human air that has about 50 to 70 microns of thickness. So if we think about PM tens, like we, we I mentioned before, we can fit in into this uh, um, thickness about five to seven types of particles that are PM ten, right? But then if we go for PM two point five, which are much smaller, we compare them to the human hair or to fine beach sand, then we could put a lot of, of these tiny, tiny, tiny particles in this thickness. And the thing is that these particles are carriers of different chemical compounds. So these compounds can be uh, metals, can be organic compounds, can even have aerobiological uh, coming from bacteria, from um, fungus or from other species. And um, they can uh, also carry metals and organic salts. And the fact that they carry this type of chemicals, well, this gives them a property of reactivity. And this reactivity is driven by the um, gaining or losing different radicals or what we call uh, oxidative um, stress. And uh, this, um, this reactivity will turn into, um, they can turn some of these compounds into free radicals. And this is important because this same type of physical chemical activity will take place within the organism or in the cells. So for this, we 
look at the particles in terms of their kinetics. So how do they distribute or how do they behave in the respiratory tract? So before we saw that uh, a little bit complicated graph where we can see the size of the particle and how deep in the respiratory tract it can reach. But uh, we have the deposition that will depend on the size, but also some of them can translocate or transient into the bloodstream and then affect other, uh, not only be or uh, deposit in the uh, lung or in the respiratory tract, but go to other, to, other, to other organs through the blood circulation. So in this sense, we have, we inhale little particles or small particles. We have, we can have translocation of the particles that will in turn, uh, generate or induce the their phagocytosis, phagocytosis by alveolar uh, macrophages, the release of cytokines, so we'll have a local inflammatory reaction. Also, the addition of other molecules, so it, it will also affect the endothelia, which, are, which is the inner part of the blood vessels, activate the migration and addition of other inflammatory cells, and then circulate in the bloodstream and reach other organs. So for this, it's been also very well established that the surface, the solubility, or the reaction that they induce will generate the uh, larger amount of reactive oxygen species because of the ability of particles to react and to lose or gain electrons. And this type of reactive oxygen, or maybe even nitrogen species, will then um, uh, generate an imbalance of an antioxidant response, which will take us to an oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress, if it's not um, uh, taken care of or balanced, it can take us to what we know as oxidative damage, which means one of these generated reactive species will damage one of the major biomolecules in the cells, which is the DNA proteins, or lipids in the membrane. And all this type of cell injury can take us to different type of diseases. For this, we know that exposure to particulates according to their size uh, have been reported to induce respiratory um, effects or respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases as hypertension and cardiac function, atherosclerosis, cardiac stroke, but also it can affect, it can affect other non-target organs or other organs because they circulated in the blood like the kidneys or the central nervous system. So in this sense, if this is happening in, or this has been reported to be explored in uh, adults, but of course it's also gonna be happening in children. We've done, our group and other groups here in UCI, there is a long, long um, history of very nice, interesting studies that are related with the, um, the exposure of particles and use of in vivo models. But more and more, we in the last decade, it was studies that were related with uh, PM or particle tissue injury, role of oxidative stress and inflammation, the use of specialized animals, and now we are looking also into disease progression, early life exposure, non-target organs, and the use of new, new technologies to figure out what are the implications or what is the implication of this type of exposure. So in my firm laboratory, what we performed was a study where we exposed um, a male rats to coarse, fine, and ultra-fine particles and filtered air. Uh, for eight weeks and uh, for three days, sorry, and eight weeks to concentrated particles. So if in the air we had about 50 and 22 micrograms per cubic meter, which is still a little bit above the guide, the, the, guide, the air quality guide, guideline. We exposed them, we concentrated them and exposed the animals using a concentrate, an air pollution concentrated system, a concentrator, which uh, it's also here in the air pollution health effects laboratory. And uh, with this, we, uh, we did uh, two 
an acute and a subchronic exposure. And we pair this with um, some uh, characteristics of the particles that I'm not going to go into detail of it, but what we wanted to figure out or to investigate was the involvement of inflammation, oxidative stress, and if there was certain type of systemic response. This is a concentrator that I had in my former laboratory. And uh, well, what we do is collect air directly, collect the air directly from the real environmental scenario, take it into the lab, make or uh, generate a small type of atmosphere. Some will be exposed to large particles, uh, smaller particles and to filter air. And then we take the models and we study them to establish if uh, they, uh, the type of responses or toxicity they have. So for this study, we looked at inflammation, oxidative stress, the participation of systemic toxicity and the programming that I talked about or the toxicogenomic evaluation. So I'm gonna go very quickly through this uh, type of parameters because I wanna uh, uh, go into more, more detail and uh, you'll see why, which is related to the exposure or what, I, what is the impact to the next generation. So first we established, is there inflammation related to the exposure of particles? So we have our scheme, which is filter air, coarse particles, fine particles, ultra fine particles. These are the acute exposures. And we chose three type of pro-inflammatory markers that are related, as I mentioned before, with the response of the cells of the alveolar region to a strange or a, an alien type of of a molecule or of the presence of an antigen. And in this case, that is the particles and also a recruiter of macrophages. So here, what we saw is that uh, the exposure to ultrafine particles did induce, for instance, the increase of um, TNF alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. However, we did not observe this at the subchronic exposure. The same situation happened with interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and with the uh, macrof macrophage recruiter. So this means that we have an acute, immediate, or a very quick uh, response, uh, particularly to fine and ultrafine particles. But however, with time, the constant exposure up to eight weeks, did not uh, the uh, the organism kind of uh, adapts to the situation, and we don't see this type of reaction. What happens when 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 we have an acute inflammation? Well, there can be, for instance, the susceptibility to some antigens or bacteria and virus. We just been through a very complicated situation for the last two years. So, people in scenarios where they have air uh, are um, where there are uh, high levels of particles fine and ultra fine could we can say they could be more susceptible to have a reaction or to be affected by different type of organisms and in this case covid i i'm sure that you are aware that this is also uh, there are so many nice studies that are going out relating air pollution and covid cases also in this study, we wanted to see whether there was oxidative damage. And we looked at this by identifying the formation of DNA adducts that are related specifically with the breakage of the DNA and with this breakage to be um, uh, binded to um, PAH or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are organic compounds that are bound to particles. So in this, um, in, in our study first, we looked in, the, in this panel, we are looking at the carbonylation, which is the um, presence of oxidative damage in the coarse, fine, and ultrafine, um, coarse, fine, and ultrafine exposed group in the acute exposed animals, but we don't see this in the subchronic which means again that there's some type of re repairing or some type of um, uh, defense that is avoiding this type of damage. And then when we look at the adduct formation, we saw 
that the binding of organic compounds stays in the groups that are exposed to fine and ultra fine particles. And it does stay even after eight weeks in the ultra fine particle um, group. So this is telling us that the compounds contained or bound to the particles, especially to ultra fine particles have more organic uh, species and that this species will affect the lung tissue. We also looked at the antioxidant response first in the lung. So we looked at uh, certain molecules that are related with the antioxidant response element, particularly NRF2 and their uh, downstream um, enzymes and molecules like superoxide dismutate and hemoxygenase and glutathionase transferase. And we observed that there was uh, a response an activation with the fine and ultra fine particles again, and not with um, not with the coarse particles, but uh, does not mean that they are not toxic. It's just a different type of, of response. And we wanted to see whether this also happened in the aorta, uh, taking into uh, account the aorta like a linkage between the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. And what's interesting is that the acute uh, response or the acute antioxidant response, we observe it in the lung, but not in the aorta. However, in the subchronic exposure, we can see there's also, so after uh, eight weeks, after a constant um, uh, exposure to this type of emission or to this type of toxicant in the air, it's not only affecting at the level of the respiratory tract, but it's also going into system or into the system or into systemic type of events. So this takes us to study the cardiovascular effects. And for this, we chose to go around the renin angiotensin system. The renin angiotensin system or RAS is a hormonal system that regulates the blood pressure, extracellular corporal volume, and sodium potassium balance. The RAS overaction plays a central role in the pathophysiology of the vis vascular disorders, which include hypertension, stroke, retinopathy. And to study RAS, we studied several elements of the RAS system or um, the renin angiotensis system, but I'm only gonna focus on AT1 receptor because it's the best characterized angiotensin receptor. It has vasopressor effect and regulates aldosterone secretion. And it is an important effector controlling blood pressure and volume in the cardiovascular system. This receptor, the, one of the first questions we ask is, this receptor is known to be present in several tissues. So one of the um, first question we ask is, what is its state or what are its um, level of activation as a response to the exposure of particles and this was the, the uh, PhD project of a student that I had in my former institution. So what we saw is that in the lung, we observed the activation by the exposure of fine and ultra fine particles, and also um, the protein levels. So we've confirmed not only the expression, but also the protein levels uh, in the lung due to the exposure to um, to coarse, fine, and ultrafine particles. So this is giving us or is indicating to us uh, that there is activity or that is a relationship between the lung and the heart in the same groups uh, with this um, molecule that is related to blood pressure, but it's also related to the regulation of the hormonal balance between the lung and the heart, which is also always happening when we are breathing. And in response to that, it not only did we see this activation in the lung, but we also observed this activation in the heart. Later, we wanted to relate this with the physiological parameters. So we measure hypertension or we measure blood pressure in the same subjects exposed to PM 2.5. And we saw that there was an increase. So we could uh, say that there's a, a relationship between the exposure to particular matter of 2.5 microns and hypertension and an acute or a three-day exposure or subchronic eight-week exposure. 
course, if we do um, a larger uh, time period exposure, we most probably will also coincide with uh, uh, um, alteration of heart reactivity, of heart, um, heart rate and other cardiovascular parameters. For this, and this is the last study that I'm gonna show you, we then wanted to see, well, if we know that there's a relationship with cardiovascular um, effects that are related with exposure to particles, what happens when there is prenatal or in utero exposure to small particles? So if you remember, the ultrafine particles are those that are less of one micron. And uh, this is another study of another PhD student in the lab. So ultrafine particles have been related, again, with several effects in the system, in the body, hypertension, pulmonary dysfunction, heart failure. And um, they have also been related with effects in the placenta and the offspring. And again, with the underlying mechanisms, the same type of underlying mechanisms that we explored before, like inflammation and oxidative stress, and um, there are key molecules um, that have been um, identified that are participating in this. So uh, given that there's all these pathways or pathways that are related with the metabolisms of organic compounds, with the antioxidant um, response element, with the inflammation, then we wanted to see whether we could study something related with the programming of the genes or the activation of the genes that are related to all these type of responses. So for this, we use a model. I'm not gonna go a lot into detail, but you can see the paper for sure. So where we expose gestational, in a gestational stage, we expose the mothers to uh, ultrafine particles. And we looked at the placenta, the fetus and the offspring which we let grow 50 days post exposure. For this, I'm just showing you some data. What we observed was some embryo reabsorption, a reduction on the number of the pups, and a reduction in the weight of the fetuses and the placenta after the exposure to ultrafine particles. We also observed some inflammation and biotransformation enzymes, placental stress, also related to inflammation and oxidative stress. And we went to see fetal programming. The, we observed this free fetal programming by going to uh, using uh, the uh, epigenetic markers, the ep and we observed the epimethylation, which means that these genes are being um, activated to account for or to try to defend the system from the aggressor, which is the uh, ultrafine particle exposure. And we chose, um, the, so we chose genes that were related with the cardiovascular response with uh, increased blood pressure with hypertension because that was the model that we had observed before that uh, had some responses. So later, uh, during a sabbatical study that I did in Health Canada, I looked at it from the using high throughput uh, technologies, toxicogenomics, and we looked at the, the this different type of tissues, the lung of the mom or the dam, placenta, the fetus, the lung of the first generation, and then we expose animals again to ultrafine particles to see the type of response that we were, uh, we wanted to see whether there was certain type of defense or if the lesion or the injury was gonna be even, uh, hard, even stronger. So for this, and uh, this is uh, what the first thing that we did is look at the differentiated expression of the genes. So genes that were expressed negatively or positively. And you can see that the number of genes that are expressed within the pups that were exposed again to ultrafine particles is logically much more higher than the genes expressed in the mom or even in the first generation. The first generation uh, uh, individuals were exposed only during their maternal life. So this is very important because they should not have, uh, uh, if, they, if they were not directly exposed, why would they have these this, this, uh, great differences? In a second part, we wanted to see if any of these tissues had relationships among them. So giving like the first 
uh, tissue that is exposed, which is the lung, then the fetus, the placenta, and if it's like, if it transcends into the first generation or the offspring. And we can see that there are some shared genes, but they pretty much maintain themselves to the type of uh, organism that we were studying. However, when we wanted to, or we went to see the gene ontology, which is the relationship with processes that are known that are related with those, the down regulation or up regulation of those genes, we were able to relate it with biological process terms. And these biological process terms were in the mom, in the long dam that was exposed directly. We looked at, we saw that there were uh, biological process uh, terms that were more related to cell injury, to cell response, chemiotaxis. When we see, we, we measured this in the fetus, we saw that they were more related to genes that are um, involved in system development and the immune response and metabolic processes. And when we looked at the first generation, we saw that there's certain oxidative stress and that they are developmental processes that are being impaired. But finally, when we looked, when we exposed again, we can see that the same uh, genes that were present in the first exposure were much, much, um, a, a larger number of genes were induced and they were induced in a, in a larger intensity in relation to the second exposure. So we can say that the, even though there's a one direct exposure, the tissue is already, we can say it's already primed or programmed for this uh, very intense response because it was exposed during the maternal life. So, uh, uh, Andrea, I uh, yeah. just wanted to kind of give a heads up. We have about. Uh, okay. A yeah, I'm almost for... finished. Thank Great. you. Okay. Right. So, so I'm just going to uh, go further and where we looked at different type of pathways, but the most important pathway that I want to show you is the pathway that is related with cardiovascular disease. So in this sense, we went and looked at um, diseases or pathways that were related with the renin angiotensive or the RAS system, and um, as I um, and also with the, the, these two pathways came up in the post animal or the animal that was exposed again. So uh, with this, uh, I just want to go through the fact that the RAS system was stimulated or was uh, induced in the animals that were exposed again, but not in the animals of the first generation, but, but yes, in animals of the first generation exposed again. So they're already primed to this type of damage. So in this sense, uh, what is very important is we, re, we relate or, or we later see that this same type of situation is being also reported for human studies. So we can say that the gene alterations that they are finding of the, the, the link between cardiovascular effects in children and the transition in certain type of cardiovascular diseases can be related to the exposure that took, um, that took place during the maternal life. So are we doing enough in this sense to secure the future of the next generation? So in this sense, I wanna point out two things. One is that this is a global issue. Although sometimes it seems that it's very local because we're looking at the cars, we look at, we're looking at different uh, perhaps industries that are in your place. This is happening in all the world in high income countries, up to 52% of children and in low income countries, almost all children are living in conditions that are not of clean air. So in this sense, what can we do or what are the challenges? We need to put this in the policy agenda as number one. We need to manage exposure to air pollution of children. So training of pediatricians, of family doctors, even of the parents on where and how children should be exposed. And if we have a day that is not clean in the air, we should try to avoid children to go out. The healthcare should be focused to the exposure of this certain type of diseases. So try to identify 
diseases that are related with exposure for air pollution in the type of diseases that children are presenting and not do it in a manner that is completely independent one from the other. Stronger pu uh, uh, public policy and programs that where we are monitoring diseases that are related to air pollution. And more studies like the ones that we do in the lab, because there's much more and more that we don't know. We are not talking about certain type of compounds yet that we know that they are in the particles and that they could be driving cell injury or the, or the specific diseases. So first, there are strategies. We should work for cities that are, have more places to walk, safe cycling lanes, low emission zones, efficient, energy generation and improved practice guidance for industries. Also cities that are intelligent that have better type of public transport and go for low emission vehicles. And here I have, um, I still have mixed feelings because apparently we are only focusing on low emission vehicles and we're not looking at the rest of the things that we can do. So what we want, and I just with that, I'm gonna finish is we need clean air and we need our children to live and survive in this clean air, right? We need health professionals to be trained thinking about this situation and not only looking at the diseases as isolated situations, but looking at this child, these children, where do they live? Do they live in an area which they could be exposed to a certain type of emission? What is the emissions indoors? of the household, et cetera. And with this, we can do things by ourselves, very small actions maybe, but look at the maintenance of our car, have our car always in the in adequate type of mileage, in, uh, close the gas caps. This can be very silly, but you'd be surprised if you were in the highway and you see how many cars did not close their gas caps correctly. I've seen it many times. Start smart commuting, walk or cycle, and have safe routes to school, safe routes for air pollution, not only safe routes of people running over uh, in the car, but safe routes in terms of the cleanness of the environment, the use of low emission vehicles, but not it's not the only way, well, there's so much more we can do, and use the information that you have available in your hand. So you can see Instagram, you can see Facebook, but you can of course also see immediately the type of air quality there is, so you can take a smart decision to go out. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are the easy actions that I think we can do to have a better environment for the children. Thank you, and sorry for taking more time. Oh uh, yeah, and this is some of the literature that I talked about. If you wanna take a screenshot, please. Feel free to do so. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Andrea, we're going to take a couple uh, questions that came up sure. in the Q and A, and I'll just go from the top. Um, first one's from Hayden. Uh, if you can see it on there, I believe one of the previous slides associated oxidative stress with an increase in glomerular filtration. Shouldn't oxidative stress be associated with a decrease in EGFR? Uh, uh, these questions are the, in the Q and R. Yeah. Uh, sorry. That's uh -huh. Okay. Increase in glomerular filtration. Yeah, they are. Uh, sorry. Yeah, they are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Maybe there was a typo there, but they are, it is released with the decrease in glomerular filtration. Yes, for sure. Okay. Take that next one. Sorry, yeah. Is the problem of the polluted air with all of these fine and ultra fine particles reversible? I believe so, but we definitely need to change the way we, let's say, we do all our, our activities, right? So can we have like, for instance, like in one of the slides that I have, certain hours or certain uh, level of flow of, of vehicles, so we don't, uh, we're not emitting all, because if you see the highways are still like, if you wanna go to somewhere in the four or five at certain times, it's impossible because there's like a huge parking lot. So we're, the activities are not being organized in a way that we can generate traffic in a more orderly way so we can have less emissions. 
So a lot of the, um, the contributors for fine and ultra fine particles are vehicle emissions, but also uh, in, in a larger um, amount, also some industries. So I think if we change, if we can have better public transport, if we could have trains or uh, maybe, I don't know, metros or, or buses that are taking a lot of people to the same places, then we would, make, we would be you reducing the uses, so usage of cars. Okay, perfect. Uh, also from Sammy, uh, same, Sammy, uh, do you think mm -hmm. that individuals with weaker immune systems will be more affected by polluted air? Definitely, yes. Yes, that's what you see in people that are getting constantly respiratory infections, people that have uh, asthma also, that their immune system can be compromised. Great. And then uh, last one from Sammy, uh, making elderly people more vulnerable and they will have much more problems related to polluted air. Yes, uh, elderly people are also a vulnerable population that we should take care of. And uh, yeah, here I just focus in children because I, the study that we did, uh, we did a maternal exposure and we were able to follow, the, follow up the toxicity markers using the high throughput technologies. But I'm sure if you do models that are related with, um, with the last part of, of life, also you will see that these individuals are also compromised. Right. I'm going to actually jump to the chat. Joel Gonzalez had a mm -hmm. question. Has there been studies done related to increased risk of, risk of CBD effects in those with vulnerable conditions such as asthma? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, there, has, there have been uh, many studies that are related with the different type of cardiovascular diseases. And um, there is a link between or there are uh, hypotheses linking asthma with cardiovascular diseases, asthma with cell proliferation. And will this be focused on certain type of exposure? Most probably, if we look at the exposure from uh, contaminants in the air, I'm sure we'll be able to, to see this. But um, if we look at like a punctual exposure in an occupational set setting, possibly we will also identify the relationship so there is um, the fact that the organism is getting a less amount of oxygen will prime to other type of uh, diseases that are that are have to do with the balance or or the homeostasis of an individual. Great. Looks like we have one more from Connie. Connie uh, asks, "What kinds of efforts are currently being done?" to engage physicians to address air pollution and affiliated health-related conditions? Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot answer that because I don't know how the system works very well here. In um, I know that we are putting forward the agenda of having uh, physicians look at toxicology, learn a little bit more about environmental health, have public health uh, specialist professionals talk to the doctors because it's the doctor, the clinician is the one who's doing the diagnostic, right? But how much is he or she aware of relating certain type of respiratory, even cardiovascular disease in a, in a child with their environment where they live? Do they ask the proper questions? So I think that this has to start when we are training the physicians. So in the way that the recruitment of the information, the data is put out for uh, making the, all the decisions should also consider, okay, is exposure considered there? Is exposure to air pollutants? Because of course, somebody that um, perhaps is working with another type of toxicant may also want that. But in this case, in the case of air pollution, it's an exposure that is, uh, involuntary is there and we need to breathe and we need to go out of our houses to do our thing. So this should definitely be in the training, I think, and should definitely be considered for certain diseases that now we know in terms of uh, acute exposures and then chronic exposures. Okay, perfect. So it looks like that is the rest of the Q&A. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, we will be 
Uh, this is being recorded and it will be included in our uh, April newsletter, which will go out on Thursday evening. So look for that um, and always feel free to email me if, if, uh, if you need the recording of this. And I want to thank you, Andrea, for joining us today and um, giving this very thoughtful, uh, interesting presentation. Well, and thank you in uh, my, I'm sorry, my email is there also. So people, if people want to reach out and uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to share more information about this. And thank you for inviting me. All right, everyone have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, bye.